we continue. Chapter 2, Verse 8 In Aleister Crowley's The Diary of a Drug Fiend Book 3, Purgatorio I said, I didn't see how I could even begin to be cured, and pointed out the nature of the deadlock. Well, he said, you aren't making any allowance for something that the doctors all talk about, and forget nine-tenths of the time, which is yet the only thing that saves them from, from being found out as the ignorant meddlers they are. Do you know that the post-mortems on people who die in New York hospitals show that about 50% of the cases have been wrongly diagnosed? No, Sir Peter. While you and I are wasting our time discussing our troubles, there is one thing working for us never stops, day or night, and that is beast Medicatrix Natura. Lala nodded emphatically. Didn't you notice that even in the Red Cross, she said to Lou, the cases that got well were those that were left alone. All the surgeons did was to repair, as well as possible, the interference with nature caused by the wound. Anything beyond that was a mistake. We'll be back in about an hour, said Lamas, and take you to lunch at Hindhead. Have you a pocket knife, by the way? Why, yes, I said with a surprise. Why? Otherwise, I would have left you mine. You may need one to sharpen your pencil. Lou and I fell to talking as soon as they were gone. We were already better in this respect that we had began to take an interest in ourselves once more. We resorted once or twice to heroin during the absence of our friend, and we made a kind of a little family joke of keeping each other up to the mark in the matter of recording the facts. I discovered what had amused King Lamas on the first occasion. I was conscious of a distinct shade of annoyance at having to get up and make a little cross. It had never occurred to me to break my word. There was a fascination in watching the record. The drive was a revelation. It was like coming out of a charnel house into the fresh air, a keen cold wind beat against our faces, almost blinding us. It was not until we reached the inn that we remembered that we had come out without any heroin. Lamas was immediately all sympathy when he heard of our plight. He offered to go out and get some immediately, but Lala protested that she was dying of hunger, and she was sure that lunch would restore our strength just as well and King Lemus could go out immediately when we were finished eating. We agreed. We could hardly do anything else, but as a matter of fact, the fresh air had excited in us both a very keen appetite. The meal did us a lot of good, and at this conclusion, our host slipped out unostentiously and returned in ten minutes with a little packet of powder. And of course, one of the things is when people are turning to drugs of all sorts, really, is that, um, is it something that could be addressed by diet? Or otherwise? It struck me as very extraordinary that he should have been able to procure it at so remote a place without a prescription. But Lou's eyes were fixed on him with an expression of delighted curiosity. I felt as though, somehow or other, she had divined the secret. 
she seemed intensely amused at my perplexity and stroked my hair in her most patronizing manner. You poor brainless creature, she seemed to be saying with her fingertips. Well, we all had heroin with our second cup of coffee, and my spirits rose immediately. Lavis produced two little notebooks, which he had bought in the village, so that we might record our doses while we were out and copy them on our charts when we got back. We drove back to London and had tea on the way. In a cottage where the people seemed to know our friends very well. It was kept by a little old man and his wife, who had the air of being family retainers. The cottage stood well away from the road and grounds of its own. Two mighty yew trees stood one on either side of the gate. Lala told us that the place belonged to the order of which King Lamus was the head, and that he occasionally sent people down here for certain parts of his training, which could only be carried out in solitude and silence. A great longing came upon me to experience the subtle peace which indwelt this simple habitation. For some reason or other, I felt a natural disinclination to take the dose of heroin which was offered to me. It seemed out of keeping with the spirit of the surroundings. I took it and enjoyed it, but the act was mechanical, and the effect in some obscure fashion unsatisfactory. We drove back to town and had dinner in my new apartment, where they had an excellent restaurant service. I found that during the day I had fifteen sniffs of heroin. Lou had only had seven. I had eleven. That's quite a bit, though. Um, particularly since they were taking higher doses than others. What would that amount to? Lou only had seven. So what? That would be something like point three. Uh, you know, 300 and something milligrams, and she... Th 100 and something milligrams? Yeah, that's... that's Still quite a dose. Um, oh, Lou only had 11. Okay, sorry, that's not that's not it that's at all. That's a much higher number. Um, the reaction in my mind was this. If she can get on with 11, why shouldn't I? Though I hadn't sufficient logic to carry on the argument to the people, millions of them, who hadn't any at all, and seems to be thriving. Yeah, maybe she was taking about a quarter gram, and he was taking like... More like a third of a gram. Um, the reaction in my mind was this. She could get along with eleven. Why shouldn't I? Though I hadn't sufficient logic to carry on the argument to the people... Millions of them who hadn't had any at all, and seemed to be just thriving. We were both pretty tired. Just as Lamas and Lala rose to leave, I took a final sniff. What did you do that for? He said, if you don't mind my asking. Well, I think it was to go to sleep. But this morning you told me you took it to wake up, he retorted. That was true, and it annoyed me, especially as Lou, instead of being sympathetic, gave one of her absurd little laughs. She actually seemed to take a perverse pleasure in seeing me caught out in a stupidity. But Lemus took the matter very seriously. Well, he said, it certainly is extraordinary stuff. If it does, two precisely opposite things at the will of the taker. He spoke sarcastically. He refrained from telling me what he told me long afterwards, that the apparently contradictory properties that I was ascribing to it were really there, that it can be used 
by the expert to produce a number of effects, some of which would seem at first sight mutually exclusive. Well, look here, Sir Peter, went on Lemus. You can't have it both ways. You really ought to make up your mind as to the purpose of taking a dose. I replied rather piteously that we had found out long ago that we couldn't sleep without it. Mabel Black had told us that. And the result of that delusion, returned Lamas, is that she's dead. I think your experience has been influenced by her foolish remark. You have told me yourself that the delightful result in the first instance was to keep you lying awake all night in a state of suspended animation with a most fascinating flow of fancies filling your brain. I had to admit the truth of what he said. Heroin, he explained, is a modification of morphine, and morphine is the most active of the principles of opium. Now surely you remember what Wilkie Collins says in the Moonstone about opium and its preparations, that they have a stimulating effect followed by a sedative effect. Heroin is much more positive in its action than opium. And, you know, because opium has a balance of things, so it doesn't have a strong one thing or the other, right? Um, and the reasonable thing to do, as it seems to me, would it be go ahead with it pretty hard in the morning and keep yourself going by that means, but to leave it entirely alone for some hours before you go to bed so that the sedative effect may send you nicely to sleep at the proper time. Now, I, fa I found that with opium myself, not recreational use, um, like I literally needed it to eat. Um, it wasn't that much pain, but the, uh, yeah, it, it helped me eat, and then I, then I'm, went to sleep for the first, and got a good night's sleep for the first time in days and all that. Um, sort of dreamy, naughty sort of feeling. But you kind of push yourself through to eat, because they'll say, well, I don't, uh, that took away some of the pain. I can eat now. And, you know, um, I know the objection to that, that the abuse of the drug has left you full of nervous irritability. The reason why you want heroin at night is to deny yourself to that. When you take it in the morning, after a night's rest, you are giving it to a more or less healthy person, refreshed by sleep. It is able to stimulate to stimulate you, because your sleep has given you some reserves of force on which it can work. When you take it at night, you are administering it to a sick person which is a very different thing. However, what you should do is to replace it at night by these tablets with a nice warm drink of whiskey or rum and water, and you will find yourself asleep before you know it. Now, there is, as much as some things react stronger when you combine some things, uh, yeah, don't drink with your pills. Alcohol even with medicine, the the harm and the risk outweighs the benefits. So, yeah. But, you know, this was, you know, 100 years ago. Um, I've literally s seen ads for medicinal whiskey, <laughs> which is... Um, okay, I'm getting directed at that. Uh, then in the morning, you awake much fresher than usual. And the heroine will have something more to catch hold of. The result of this will be that you will find quite a small quantity do you as much good as a big one did last week, and more. Well, all that seemed pretty sensible to me. We took his advice. We did not go to sleep at once. I felt my thoughts too varied. They wandered from one thing to another without reasonable sequence. There seemed to be gaps of unconsciousness between two sets of thoughts, but eventually the irritation subsided and I knew no more till the morning. 
We woke very late, completely exhausted, but as Lamas had prophesied, the heroin took hold immediately. The first two doses made us lively, and with the third, we were out of bed and having a bath for the first time in, I'm ashamed to say, how long. Lou fell into a rage at the condition of our underwear, and of our outer clothes too. For the matter of that, it was all soiled and dirty and stained. We must literally have stunk. And I've definitely heard of individuals that, in their drug stages, you know, they don't, they don't, you know, have literally gone a month or so, two, or even two without washing their, not only their bedding, but their their clothing on themselves, even longer bedding, I've heard that sort of stuff. Um, but just like a lot of what we hear with the rest of it, even when the stuff wasn't adulterated, they were like, you know, they didn't care about food and stuff. Um, it wasn't. And with the realization of this came an acute feeling of disgrace that we should have been going about with Lamas and Lala in such a condition. If they had said anything about it to us, we might have worked up an artificial indignation about it. But that they should have said nothing was absolutely damnable. We could not tolerate the idea of ourselves, and yet, only 48 hours before, nothing mattered at all. Lou, in a state of almost insane excitement was calling up Barley Grange on long distance. The housekeeper was to set up something to wear that morning. While she shouted the order, I suddenly recollected that Lamas and Lala were coming in after lunch. The clothes couldn't possibly reach us till after three o'clock. The best thing to do was to have some dressing gowns sent up from Piccadilly. They sent people round with a selection at once, and what with that and sending out for some toilet things and having in the hairdresser, we made ourselves fairly presentable by half past one. That morning gave me the impression of a vaudeville turn or farce. We had to dodge about from one room to another, according as male or female angels ministered unto us. The excitement kept our minds off heroin very successfully, but it obtruded itself constantly on our notice, nonetheless by insistent physical attacks. Of course, we warded them off at once by taking suitable doses. I cannot say that there was any real munition. For one thing, taking the stuff by the nose, you can't tell exactly how much you were getting, and a good deal of what you take is wasted. But the whole atmosphere has changed. We'd have been taking it till now in a steady, regular manner. It had become a continuous performance, but this morning, each patch of craving and each dose were definite incidents. The homo genity of the vice. Had been broken up into sections. The dull monotony of the drug had developed dramatic qualities. We were reminded of our early experiences with it. We had, to a certain extent, recovered what addicts call drug virginity. That alone was sufficient to fill us with a keen sense of exhilaration. We had regained the possibility of hope. On the other hand, we were brought very sharply up against ourselves by the efforts of the hairdresser and the haberdasher. The smart new dressing gowns contrasted so strikingly with the deadly illness of our appearance. However, we could see the daylight far off, and we sat down to lunch with a certain pleasure. Our appetites had not returned, of course, 
and we ate very little of the, the light and exquisite food we had ordered. But at least the idea of food did not disgust us, as had been too long the case. Lammas came in in time to join us at coffee. It was easy to see that he was pleased at the result so far obtained. Lala was not with him. Instead, he had brought Macy Jacobs. I found myself wondering acutely whether there was any serious reason for the change. I had got to the state, where I suspected the man's slightest action of having some occult significance, especially as he gave no explanation. Decidedly, his manners were not calculated to reassure the unwary. It was easy to understand why his name had become the focus for a host of ridiculous inventions. After all, it is not pleasant to feel oneself in the presence of an intelligence capable of outmaneuvering one's own at every point without even taking the trouble to do so. The way he took everything for granted was in itself annoying. He strolled over to the charts and stood studying them for a long time while he puffed out a cigar. Even the cigar was offensive. It was the kind that millionaires have specially made for themselves. Lemus smoked no other kind, and yet he was a comparatively poor man. Of course, the explanation was perfectly simple. He really understood and really appreciated good tobacco, and preferred to indulge in cigars disproportionately. It was the man's own business what he smoked, and yet he had managed to get himself an absolutely bad name in London. On that one trait alone, people felt that it was monstrous for him to dine on mutton chop and a piece of Stilton, and then pull out a cigar that cost half as much again as his dinner. He studied our charts as if they had been maps and he was trying to work out his overland route from Bokhara to Kathmandu. Ultimately, he said, there seems a very long gap here, 15 hours, 9 to 12. That's right, isn't it? He turned to Maisie for confirmation. He was, so he said, quite unable to trust himself to calculate. Maisie entered into the spirit of the absurdity and counted it solemnly out on her fingers. The tone of his voice had been mournful, as if his plans had been seriously disconcerted. That was another trick of his that put people off. It was Lou's sparkling eyes that told me what he meant. And then I was brought up with a tremendous shock to realize what it meant to me. I went to the chart myself, with excited curiosity, quite as if I had never seen it before. It did not need a mathematician to put the situation into English. The crosses for the last 36 hours were crowded into a few spaces, leaving large empty gaps. In other words, the indulgence had to become irregular. I started at the chart as if it had been a ghost. Lemus turned his head and looked down at me over his shoulder with a queer grin. Then he uttered the extraordinary word Kriegspiel. I was completely taken aback. What in the name of thunder was the man talking about? And then it slowly dawned upon me that there was an analogy between the chart and the distribution of the troops in the war. It was obvious as soon as the idea struck one. As long as the armies were evenly distributed along the line, it was a matter of trench warfare. Great victories and defeats were impossible in the nature of things. But once the troops 
or massed at points of vantage, aggregated in huge mobile units, it became possible to destroy them on the large scale. When a British square is broken, the annihilation of its defenders does not come from any diminution of the fighting power of the individual soldiers. Its military value is not sensibly diminished by the loss of a few men at the point of attack. It has become worthless because of their regular arrangement has been thrown into disorder. At the Battle of Waterloo, says King Lamas, turning from the wall and going back to his coffee, Napoleon sent forward the old guard. A few minutes later, he cried, They are mixed, and drove in despair from the field. He did not have to wait to see them destroyed. Lou's breath was coming in great gasps. She had understood the essence of our friend's tactics. We looked abominably ill. We were actually suffering at the moment from the craving and embarrassed by the, pre the, the presence of Macy Jacobs. We did not want to take it in front of her, and yet we knew that we had won the victory. It might be a matter of weeks or months. We didn't even care. We were content to have mastered the principle of the thing. It would be easy to attack those clusters of crosses and eliminate them little by little. King Lamas asked Maisie to sing. Luckily, there was a baby grand in the room, you know, a piano. He sat down and began to accompany her. I found myself enthralled by watching the man mind work. It taught me something constantly. The last act, for example, we couldn't go out as we were, and the singing would be an alternative distraction. At the same time, he wanted Macy's back turned so that we could take our heroine. We wanted it very badly indeed, and yet so strange is nature. We were just as ashamed to take it secretly as a moment before we had been to take it openly. The thought hit me between the eyes. It has already been mentioned that Lou and I both had the impulse to conceal the act from each other. Even while we were taking it openly together, we wanted to pretend that we were taking less than we were. The use of drugs develops every morbid kink in the mind. Meanwhile, Macy was singing in a rich contralto voice, an English translation of one of Verlaine's most exquisite lyrics with muted strings, and I have no idea of the tone for this, Calm in the twilight of the lofty boughs, pierce we our love with silence as we drowse. Melt we our souls, heart senses in this shrine, vague languor of arbutus and of pine. Half close your eyes, your arms upon your breast. Banish forever every interest. The cradling breeze shall woo us soft and sweet, ruffling the waves of velvet at your feet. When solemn night of swart oaks shall prevail, voice our despair, musical nightingale. The exquisite images, so subtle and yet so concrete, filled my mind with memories of all my boyhood's dreams. They reminded me of the possibilities of love and peace. All this was familiar to me, familiar in the most intense and alluring form. That was what nature had to offer. This pure and ecstatic rapture was the birthright of mankind. But I, instead of being content with it as it were, was, had sought an artificial paradise and bartered the reality of heaven for it. In nature, even melancholy is subtly enthralling. I thought of Keats, 
owed to her, and even of James Thomas's Melancholia, that transcends all wit, whom he adored and on whose altar lay his bleeding heart. Well might Verlaine say, Voice our despair, musical nightingale, but in our chemical substitute for natural stimulus. Our despair could be sung by no nightingale, could even the carrion buzzard give any idea of the hoarse and horrible discord of our disenchantment. The shreds of our souls were torn by filthy fishhooks, and their shrieks were outside the gamut of merely human anguish. Was it still possible to return? Had we forfeited forever our inheritance? For a mess of beastlier pottage than ever a sow guzzled, Lammas had been watching us intently while Maisie sang. Lou's eyes were full of tears. They ran down her thin, worn face. She made no effort to wipe them away. I do not know whether she felt them. Heroin dulls all physical sensation, leaving only the dull, intolerable craving, the acrid irritation, to break in upon the formless stupor, which represents the height of well-being. But I had no inclination to weep. Mine was the bitter black remorse of Judas. I had sold my master, my true will, for thirty pieces of poisonous copper, smeared with the slime of quicksilver, and all I had brought was a field of blood, which I might hang myself, and all my bowels gushed out. Oh, uh, is, is that two of the canonical gospels buying the field of blood? King Lemus rose from the piano with a heavy sigh. Forgive me for nagging, he said slowly, but you spoilt your enjoyment your enjoyment of the song by being ashamed to put yourself in the proper condition to do so by taking the heroin that you need. How often must I tell you that there is nothing to be ashamed of and everything to be proud of? You know yourself that you are running a greater risk than you ever did when you flew over the Bach lines. I don't want you to swank about it, of course, but you certainly don't want to act like a schoolboy puffing his first cigarette behind a hedge. For God's sake, man, can't you see that half the danger of this business lies in the secrecy and duplicity which go with it? And the people who, uh, you know, make it all about the legal and official version of the thing aren't really fixing things either, but, um, what did somebody tell me? I'd like to do more things in the name of God, but, or for God and God's way and that sort of stuff, but I, I don't think I could ever do drugs that way. So they've, you know, kind of have a choice between the two, right? Um, Suppose we made all the fuss about eating that we do, about drinking and loving. Can't you see what evils would immediately arise? Remember the food restrictions do during the war. By Jove, I never thought of that. I said as a hundred half-forgotten incidents bounced into my mind. There were all sorts of stratagems for dodging the regulations on the part of people who, in the ordinary way, were plain, straightforward, law-abiding citizens. Of course, we must have restrictions about love and drink and drugs. Well, sex and love needs to be kind of separated as concepts. I mean, you can be combined at the same time, but you know what I mean. Um, it's quite obvious how frightfully people would abuse their liberty if they had it. I'm sorry to have to disagree, said Lemus. And, as you know, I've got into endless trouble of one sort or another for holding the views I do. But I'm afraid I do honestly think 
that most of the troubles spring directly from the unnatural conditions set up by the attempts to regulate the business, and in any case the state of mind brought about them is so harmful indirectly to the sense of moral responsibility that I am really not sure whether it would not be wiser in the long run to do away with the blue laws and the Lizzie laws altogether. Legislative interference with the habits of the people produces the sneak, the spy, the fanatic, and the artificial uh, and the artful dodger. Take finance. Swindling has become a fine art, and is practiced on a gigantic scale in ways which would have been impossible when there were no laws intended to protect the public. It was a very strange view to take. I could hardly believe that Lemus was serious, and yet it did seem to me that the modern criminal millionaire was actually assisted by the complexity of the company laws. You know, like corporations, it is impossible for the plain man to understand them, so that an unscrupulous man, armed with expert knowledge, is much more likely to get the better of his unwary fo fellows than in the old days when his activities were confined to thimble rigging and pulling favorites. And, well, money lending too, but, you know, um, the secularization of society has done a lot towards that end. Um, the funny thing was that as much as Judaism is one of the strictest faiths about the money, lending, and interest, and some other stuff, it's people who are identified as Jews are more likely to do that than Christians, but of course, you know, it's it's not allowed in either, so you definitely don't blame the religion, right, or or the religious identity. It's, it's the hypocrisy of the individual. O Basil, put in Macy, do tell our friends what you were saying the other day about the South Sea Islands. Lemus laughed merrily. Good for you, kid, very much to the point. I've wandered a good deal through queer parts of the world, as you know, and in some of those places there are still taboos about eating and hunting and fishing, all sorts of things which we in England take quite simply, in consequence of which they give no trouble. But where a man has to think of a thousand things before he has had his dinner, what he eats, and how it was killed, and who cooked it, and so on forever and ever, he gets no chance to develop his mind in more important ways. Well, not necessarily, but extremes of that kind of, you know. Um, taboo is responsible for the low mental and moral development of the people's whom it affects more than anything else. An appetite should be satisfied in the simplest and easiest way. Once you begin to worry about the right and wrong of it, you disturb the mind unnaturally and begin to think awry in all sorts of ways that have apparently nothing to do with it. Think of the queen of Spain who was being dragged by her horse and lost her life because of the absence of the official appointed by etiquette to assist her to dismount. We all laughed. The girls, frankly, but I, with an ill-defined, uncomfortable feeling that Lamas was getting on dangerous ground. What is modern fiction, he asked, from Hardy and Dostoevsky to the purveyors of garbage, to servant girls, but an account of the complications set up by the exaggerated importance attached by themselves are their neighbors to the sexual appetites of two or more bamenos monkeys. Bamenos? Bamenos. Oh, how is that supposed to be pronounced? 